In this lecture, we'll be looking at the visual heritage of Japan and the West's influence upon it. So one thing we should recognize at the very beginning is that Japan, before really any sustained contact with Europeans or Americans, had a rich tradition of art. A lot of this was Buddhist inspired. Uh, Shinto, the indigenous religion of Japan, doesn't really do a whole lot with representative art. Uh, Shinto shrines, in, for example, tend to be very simple. They tend to focus more on things like trees and rocks, and uh, they may have rope. And are things kind of arranged artfully, but it's not representation of human beings or people. In Buddhism, though, there is a strong tradition of the representation of human beings and gods and other things. So one of the earliest, if not the earliest example we have of comic art in Japan is actually from a Buddhist uh, known as Abbot Toba. An abbot is someone who's in charge of a monastery. So this was kind of a high-ranking Buddhist monk. And you can see from the years there, he is working in the uh, mid to late 11th century into the 12th century. And what he has here, if you look in the lower left, you can see the frog, uh, which seems to be a frog Buddha, uh, being given uh, respect or worship, veneration, how you want to say it, by a monkey. Uh, then you've got a rabbit, and it looks like a fox doing something there in the back. It looks like maybe they're reading sutras. And in the back there, you can see a monkey, a fox. Uh, those, I think, by their dress appear to be women, and they appear to be taking part in this ritual as well. And um, it, this is, I think, meant to be kind of funny. Uh, some of the other aspects of this uh, scroll that Abbot Toba made are clearly meant to be humorous, even poking fun at Buddhist priests. Uh, the fact that you have a frog Buddha, I think, is interesting. Uh, I think that my um, while this is meant to be, I think, humorous, meant to be kind of a satire, one thing I should also point out about it is that in Buddhism, uh, especially the style of Buddhism followed in Japan, there's this emphasis that all beings have a kind of Buddha nature. And so it makes sense that Buddha could also be a frog, right? So kind of continuing with this theme of the religious influence on um, comic art in Japan, you have here the Kyoto Hungry Ghost Scroll. And this was made in the late 12th century. It's color. Uh, it's a little, in a sense, more artistic, I guess you could say. It's focusing on people, but you can also see on the left, you see these people offering ritual um, food around what looks like to be kind of a stupa. That would be a kind of a stone, uh, little stone tower where a Buddhist relic would be. That, that could be that, or it could just be a stone lantern. It's not quite clear to me, but you can see they are perform they're praying the buddhist rosary uh and they're praying and they're making food offerings to those creatures that are surrounding them you can see they're quite horrible looking those are hungry ghosts and it was believed that if people died without descendants to take care of them to offer them food and uh ritually then they would become hungry ghosts and you can see they have really really small necks their necks are really thin um that's to symbolize how they're not able to really eat. And they've got gigantic stomachs because that's what happens to starving people is their stomachs kind of swell up. So this has a kind of educational purpose, right? It's showing, you know, there's this invisible world that exists around us that we can't see. And we're using this kind of representative art to do that, to show you that invisible world. And we're also instructing you about how you should behave within that invisible world, right, to impact it. Uh, and you certainly don't, if you don't offer these rituals, this is what's going to happen to your uh, to your ancestors. And you certainly want to avoid that. So this is another theme we have here is in this representative art is kind of education. Um, and like I said, it's representing this invisible world. And I should point out, you can see how very early on, if you're someone who likes anime, which I hope you are taking this course, um, you can see where some of the, the uh, like the spirits and things you see in an anime or in the ghosts have a deep past. So another very important uh, aspect about Japanese art, you can see what's called ukiyo-e. Uh, A here is Japanese for like drawing. And ukiyo refers to like the floating world. And the idea of a floating world, in a sense, is similar, uh, is actually drawn from Buddhism. Uh, in Buddhism, nothing is permanent. Um, it's, I don't want to go too much into Buddhism, but uh, Buddhism arises out of Hinduism. And in Hinduism, there was this emphasis on the soul. And Buddhism argues there is no soul. There's nothing permanent about you. 
Uh, in fact, this whole kind of thing that we perceive, not only is the world we perceive illusion, uh, we ourselves, in a sense, are kind of illusion. So there's this idea that we're kind of floating through this life of impermanency. What's curious is that the Japanese took that, and, and the Japanese are really good at this, is taking someone else, an idea from somewhere else, and making it their own and adding their own creative spin to it. They use that to talk about a kind of idea of a world of pleasure. In a sense, since there is no permanence, we should just enjoy life. And so ukiyo-e are representative pictures from the floating world. And these would be pictures of like beautiful geisha, of courtesans, of kabuki actors. Um, I chose these images because I thought think they um, are kind of sweet. Um, they're a little bit different than maybe other ukiyo-e. You can see this man and woman on the left here underneath an umbrella keeping the uh, snow off of them. And they're on a kind of a date. And I, I want to stress the, the whiteness there. The snow is meant to represent their purity. So they have a kind of pure love for each other. Um, on the right, you can see uh, a woman who has gotten up in the middle of the night to take care of her crying child. And uh, two things about that I think are very interesting. Uh, that's a very healthy baby. You want your babies to be chubby because uh, if they get sick, the weight just goes right off of them. Um, and I, I just like that. And the way the child is acting reminds me very much how my own children acted. And then uh, what I think is remarkable is that the woman, uh, though it's the middle of the night, was careful to do up her hair. <laughs> and I think that was kind of funny. Um, but it's just a nice kind of image. And so these images are interesting because they're showing also a desire to represent what's going on in just everyday life, right? These are not kind of special images like a, what we saw before of uh, an invisible world. These are things we might see. So there's this idea here too that, you know, this the everyday is also important. And one other thing I want to point out about these ukiyo-e is that these were printed. This is, these are not, in a sense, what you're seeing here are not originals. These are printings. And by the uh, 17th and 18th century and in the 19th century when ukiyo-e were very popular in Japan, these could be printed at very low prices and people would like hang them up on their walls like um, posters. So there's this kind of sense that this is also becoming a popular art, right? This is popular culture. A lot of these drawings, like, you know, what we looked at before, like the, the scrolls, those were made by the monks for the monastery. Uh, they weren't meant to kind of um, go for the popular audience. This was meant to appeal to a popular audience. So this is really going into popular culture. And you can see in Japan, it's quite uh, old. It has a very long tradition. And I, it would be remiss of me not to share with you uh, Katasushika, sorry, Katasushika, 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 I was trying to pronounce it too fast, Hokusei's famous painting of the um, wave. And it's important to stress that this too uh, is a part of popular culture even today. You know, it's not just an, an art form um, it's in, in terms of like, you know, master art or something like that, that would be favored by an elite. This is something that you could just go and buy and put on your wall and people today still put it on their walls. And one thing I just want to point out how this tradition is still very much alive. When I was flying out of Tokyo one day, I'm, I'm always paranoid. That I'm going to miss a flight because I'm late or because I have trouble getting through security because I've almost missed flights doing that. So I got there really early and I was glad I did because I was able to take part in a, um, woodblock printing of this famous wave painting. And you can see here, if you look across this table, you can see that there's different wood blocks and one of them is being painted ink. So if we go back to this, um, what happened is, you know, you can see that the wave has blue and there's parts that are white and there's parts that are yellow and they would carve on a block just that part that's supposed to be yellow or just that part that's supposed to be white. And then you would paint that block the the correct color and then you lay the piece of paper over it and like smooth it down and it picks up the ink and then you go on to the next block and the next block and the next block and boom you've got your drawing and that's why this could become a part of popular culture because it wasn't just one thing that someone drew someone drew it they used the drawing to make the carving and then they could print a whole bunch of them and then sell them at a relatively low price and even someone like me who is not artistically talented at all was able to make a somewhat decent representation of this. I didn't do that great because I got it somewhat um, off center, but it, it was good enough. Now, what that means then too, is you, like I said, you've got this kind of popular culture, you've got these cheap printing. There's also, like I, I wanna stress here, this imagination, this invisible world is going to be made visible through kind of adventure, um, ukiyo-e. Uh, prints and even 
uh, popular literature. So you can kind of see that here. I mean, this is wonderful. It's a samurai like in a haunted house. And he's being attacked by a giant skeleton. I mean, this is cool. And this is by uh, Utagawa Kuniyoshi. So I think it's very striking. So you can see this kind of imagination that has really come in here and how it's kind of responding to popular tastes. And you can see this all combined in what are called kibiyoshi, which are books like this. And it's kind of an illustrated book. In 17th, 18th, 19th century Japan, there was growing literacy. More and more people were learning to read. Books were cheap, so they had something to read. And they weren't just reading to learn something. They were also reading to be entertained. And you can see here a kind of antecedent to manga. It's not exactly the same thing. There's a lot more narration there. But you can kind of see here that you've got this samurai story and some wonderful narration discussing what's going on. So you can see that by the 19th century, Japan has a rich visual and artistic heritage that has become, in a sense, popular, meaning that lots of people are able to afford and take part in it. And they're going to be producing drawings and books and things like that for this market, which a group of people who are growing uh, in literacy are able to take part in. Right? So we have the foundations right, for the later development of anime and manga within Japan.